All right, we're gonna go ahead and get started with today's webinar. Um, it's titled Ways to Achieve a Youthful Glow, discussing the latest anti-aging treatments and techniques with Dr. Kalpesh Vakaria. He's an associate professor of otorhinolaryngology, head and neck surgery, and he's also the chief of facial plastic and reconstructive surgery at the University of Maryland. We invite you to leave your questions for Dr. Vakaria using the questions or chat feature found in GoTo and he will address them at the end of the presentation. You can also send us a, uh, an email if you feel more comfortable that way, if you don't want to submit it publicly, um, and we'll be sure to include your question at the end. All right, Dr. Vicaria, go ahead and take it away. Well, thanks, Meredith, and thanks everyone for uh, coming for our webinar on ways to achieve a, a more youthful glow. Some disclosures, um, I don't have any financial uh, interests or arrangements or affiliations with any of the organizations that I'm gonna be speaking about or any conflicts of interest uh, related to this activity. I am a faculty member of the AO, uh, which is a trauma organization outside of that, um, which is not related to what we're talking about today. Uh, I will discuss some non-FDA approved treatment options and uh, we'll mention some commercial products. Um, and photos from the literature were primarily used to demonstrate principles uh, to, to avoid any kind of uh, patient privacy uh, issues here. Uh, I thank everyone for uh, joining in today. So what we're going to talk about is I'm going to start talking about actually screen time because that's actually changed a lot of uh, plastic surgery, especially over this past year and a half. Uh, we'll then kind of dive into facial anatomy and the kind of the anatomy of aging. Uh, to put in context the treatment options that we have. We'll talk briefly about some surgical treatment options and more in depth about non-surgical treatment options because it seems like in this day and age, uh, people are trying to you know, look at more the non-surgical options uh, if they're available. And then we'll end with uh, hopefully some time with questions. So back well before I was a facial plastic surgeon, a uh, majority of patients seem to uh, seek out cosmetic procedures or facial plastic surgery uh, because one of their friends was ha having it and so, or another friend or a colleague that they know was having it. And so that was one of the motivating factors that brought interest into uh, patients getting cosmetic type procedures. However, uh, definitely during the time that, you know, I've been a physician and surgeon, uh, interest in plastic surgery has steadily gone up over the years, especially because a lot of the stigma has a significantly decrease. And really the advent of social media, uh, your Facebook, your Instagram, your Snapchat, uh, WhatsApp, has really kind of changed the game and increased interest in cosmetic surgical procedures. And so this is, uh, in part because a lot of the stigma has been kind of uh, eliminated uh, because you have a lot of support for cosmetic procedures from uh, and promotions from celebrities and also uh, influencers that really have started to affect public interest uh, in cosmetic procedures, especially the non-invasive ones. And so I'm briefly going to talk about surgical options, but you know, the non-invasive ones, it seems to be where kind of the, the population in the field is really headed towards. Now, as the internet, so that was initially, and I would say even more recently as the internet, social media, and smartphone technology has really become more widespread, and the exchange of photographs, uh, especially selfies, has resulted in people looking at themselves and others more critically. Uh, there's been an increase of different types of apps uh, that are readily available on our computer or smartphones. So this is just one example called Facetune, where people can easily kind of do virtual plastic surgery in a sense and touch themselves up. And you can see here, you can remove blemishes, uh, you can change uh, kind of lighting, you can actually change your facial features, uh, and in a sense kind of be somewhat of a completely different person, change your background. Um, and I would say that you know, over the as as this has become more commonplace and and popular, uh, patients are seeking out cosmetic procedures because they're realizing what the potential is out there. Now, I would say in the past year and a half, definitely since the COVID pandemic, there's been another kind of shift in how we see each other and see ourselves, and this is a big part of applications like what we're using right now or Zoom, WebEx, where we're forced to look at other people 
much closer than we were in the past and look at ourselves for extended periods of times. And so this is really actually translated to a lot of patients the past year and a half uh, requesting cosmetic procedures to improve their on-screen appearance because they're noticing things that they wouldn't ordinarily notice before where they're communicating with people, such as the way their lips are looking, the way their smile lines are, uh, things around their eyes that may make them look more tired and less youthful. And so I think the timing of this is very important because this is really a time where people are starting to really critically look at themselves and say, hey, you know, there's things about kind of my facial features because I'm noticing them more that I'm, I'd be interested in potentially improving upon. So let's switch gears before talking about some of these options available to make a youthful, more youthful glow and really start talking about some anatomy because this will be important to put the different procedures in context. So the face is definitely made up of different layers, uh, starting with the skin layer. Under the skin, you have the subcutaneous fat layer. Uh, above that, you have the facial muscles, as well as the ligaments that hold the skin tightly to the underlying uh, bone. Uh, you have additional spaces. You have the facial nerve, which controls the muscles of uh, uh, the facial expression and muscles uh, that are imp important in how we communicate with each other. Um, and so, and then you have the deeper layers over the bone and the bone itself. Uh, and so aging happens on all these layers. And the different treatments that we have for facial aging uh, really address one or more of these layers. Unfortunately, there isn't one pill kind of like in the matrix which you can take and then all of a sudden all the layers are fixed and you're kind of a completely different person. That's, we haven't really achieved that as of yet. Now, the other appreciation I've gotten and I kind of try to embark and kind of give to my patients is impressed upon my patients is that kind of the face was made in a way to protect some of the critical structures around it. So you have some critical structures like your brain, your eye, your nose, your mouth, and all these structures are sensory organs. This is how we like communicate with our surroundings. And so the eyes, our ability to see, um, our our mouth is ability to speech, speak with each other, swallow, breathe. Our nose also similarly with uh, with breathing function and a sense of sensation. So the facial the facial structure is really made to house these special special organs, and the soft tissue is created in a way to protect these organs. So that's why you have all these muscles in and around the eye area. So that way you can help close your eye and open your eye to keep the eye protected. You have your kind of the appearance of your nose and the muscles around the nose, the muscle around the mouth um, to, to help protect those uh, sensory structures. Now, these muscles, which are really intended for kind of protection of these sensory structures, also give us the ability to make these various facial expressions that you see here on the right. Um, and so it's through these repetitive actions um, that we see some of the wrinkling that we uh, see on patients as we age and even kind of the in the younger age group, especially in the more expressive uh, use patients. So before talking about aging, we need to kind of think about youth and what exactly is youth. And so uh, babies are the epitome of youth. And so uh, babies have under, haven't undergone the years of wear and tear combined with the forces of gravity that has resulted in kind of aging uh, signs that we, uh, we see in our own faces. So what are like the specifics of kind of this baby or babies in general that um, make them youthful? So when you kind of look at the skin, you can see that the skin has a level of smoothness. There's, you know, when you kind of pinch their cheeks, you know, as you can see in this, this little baby just wants to, wants to have your, have her, have her um, cheeks pinched. There's a level of elasticity and kind of rebound and, and smoothness that exists uh, within the facial soft tissue structure. Um, now, most people don't want to look like our baby selves. I know I don't want to necessarily look like I was uh, one years old again. However, we do want to recreate some of the features that are associated uh, with our baby selves, especially when it comes to the volume. And so uh, this kind of part of what makes this baby so attractive is the volume, the volume in the cheeks as well, the volume in the lips and the volume around the eyes. And so that that has that understanding has really changed how we take care of patients that are looking uh, to kind of turn back the clock, uh, whether it's one year, five years, or 10 years. 
So what do we see when, when we're aging? So as I mentioned, the, the facial structure is very layered. And so kind of the most deepest or the most internal layer is the bone layer. And so the bone layer, uh, which is shown on, on the right or on the left side here, uh, and with the arrows undergoes some changes as we age. So some of the things that we see is where you can see what happens with these arrows. So the eye sockets tend to enlarge a little bit. The cheekbone tends to sink in a little bit, uh, especially if, if we start losing teeth, the upper jaw and lower jaw tend to thin as well. And so see, these are some of the kind of age associated changes that we see in the bony structure. And so um, additionally, as we go into the soft tissue, especially as you combine the forces of gravity, where you're just having gravity pushing down uh, day in and day out, that also contributes to some of the age associated patients things that we see in the face. So the sagging that we see. Um, so, so as you also age, you start losing some of that volume. So the volume is a combination of liquid volume, uh, fat volume, um, some of that elasticity or rebound uh, that we have in our faces and our skin, we start to, to lose. And so you can see in this picture where on the, on the patient's left side, the age associated changes you're gonna see sagging of the eyebrows, you're gonna see grooves developing in and around the eye area, especially between the junction of the eye uh, and the cheek. Uh, that cheek volume is gonna decrease because you have some loss of some of the fat layers uh, of the face. There's also gonna be some descent uh, as some of the tissue becomes a little bit more relaxed, which will create additional grooves, so the kind of the smile lines uh, on the uh, around the upper portion of the mouth and then lines around the or the marionette lines uh, allow next to the lower corner of the mouth um, also as you start having some sagging that tends to go on you're going to start noticing them jowling or some relaxation in the the um, the, the skin and muscles of the neck you're also going to see as we continue to use our muscles of facial expression with repetitive use such as you know puckering for those that smoke um, really puckering around the kind of a cigarette, you're going to start seeing more and more lines develop, especially around kind of the mouth in those in those patients that smoke with that repetitive puckering resulting in these kind of uh, radial lines around the mouth. Uh, and so these are some of the age associated uh, things that we see, uh, which is important to understand because there's different options for the different areas of the face that, that may bother one person. So um, when it comes to aging, we don't all age the same way. So uh, these are two Caucasian females in somewhat different age ranges, yes, but uh, the person on the left has aged differently than the person on the right. And so uh, the person on the right really demonstrates what happens when you have a lot of volume loss uh, in terms of uh, the, uh, the age associated changes as we age. Um, you're going to have some of the bony structure become more prominent. Uh, the kind of the, the full cheeks uh, that were present uh, on that baby are, are not present in, in this person. And so because of the volume loss associated with aging. Compared to the person on the left, yes, she does have some volume loss, but you can see the develop more of the fine lines and some deeper wrinkles and grooves, kind of the smile lines, the marionette lines. Um, some volume loss in the cheeks and some descent in the cheeks rather than just primarily volume loss in the person on the other side here. Um, you're going to have some grooves develop around the eyes, some excess skin around the upper eyelid and lower eyelid, um, some droopiness of the eyebrows can happen, and some asymmetry. Now, we all have asymmetry whether we're young or old, but as we age, sometimes some of this asymmetry between our right side and our left side can become a little bit more exacerbated. And so patients that uh, present to our office, um, we don't treat them all the same way. So really our goal is to figure out what areas of the face uh, are troublesome to any particular person and we direct uh, our treatment options toward that. So now the topmost layer is your skin layer. And so there's a lot of aging that tends to go on uh, when it comes to the skin layer. And so 
um, you can kind of break it up as extrinsic aging versus intrinsic aging. So extrinsic aging are things like exposure to your that happens in your environment. So chronic light exposure, sun exposure, UV light exposure, exposure to radiation or chemicals or toxins, tanning beds, if you will. Um, so these are extrinsic factors that can affect or help age the skin in a more rapid manner. And so we spend a lot of time with patients in our in our uh, in our spot talking to them about how important it is to kind of treat the skin and minimize exposure to the factors that we can we can minimize, such as minimizing UV exposure, good sun sunblock application, avoiding those tanning beds. Versus intrinsic changes or aging that happens in the skin are things that are out of our control. And these things, really, you can kind of highlight them in the non-sun exposed areas. Uh, so areas you're not really getting direct contact to the environmental factors. And so these intrinsic aging things are really kind of genetic or hormonal or some combination of the two. And so this is where it's not uncommon when patients come in, they'll say, oh, you know, my mom or my dad had really deep set eyes or they had really droopy eyebrows uh, or they had really deep smile lines. And so those are things that happen, you know, because of our genes. And so we can't really escape that or modify that. But there's a lot in general when it comes to extrinsic aging of the skin that we can modify. And so for that reason, I encourage my patients to adopt healthier lifestyles when it comes to, you know, smoking cessation, health healthy skincare regimens, combination of sunblock and moisturizers, and eliminating excess of sun exposure are, are crucial in treating some of the aging process. So I'm going to demonstrate some of the skin, especially skin-related or slightly deeper than skin-related changes that we tend to see uh, in, our, in our offices uh, related to aging. And so one of the most common things that we see is pigment. And so as we age, especially in the setting of sun exposure, um, whether it's through tanning beds or just spending multiple hours with full exposure on the beach, uh, we tend to uh, form pigment in those exposed areas of our body. And so pigments around the face, as you can see here, kind of melanocytes getting together and producing this kind of dark brownish type of pigment. Uh, pigment on our upper chest areas, uh, pigments on our cheek. And so these are very common areas uh, that we see and that contributes that to that less youthful glow, I would say, um, and con contributes to the kind of aged look uh, of the skin. Other things that we see uh, as we age are kind of broken capillaries or more prominent veins. Uh, that are mostly found on the face and often on the legs. Um, they can be caused by numerous things. Um, they can be uh, genetic, to sun exposure, to rosacea, which I'll talk a little bit briefly about, to alcohol exposure, uh, liver problems, weather changes, pregnancy, all these things that can contribute to um, uh, some of these uh, more exposed blood vessels. Uh, in the past, fortunately, we didn't really have too many options for them, but I'll talk to you about some of the more novel, innovative options available to treat uh, some of these pesky uh, blemishes that have started to, to pop up. Um, so excess hair. So this isn't per se completely related to aging, but there are areas that people will have hair that uh, usually people don't have or don't care to have. So uh, you know, in female patients, they may not like the area of the upper lip having hair, the lower lip. Uh, in male patients, just excessive hair, excessive growth on their face and neck. And so these are obviously related to genetics as well as hormonal changes that occur with, uh, related to our, to our aging. Um, but, uh, you know, contribute to a decreased kind of quality of life or decreased, uh, you know, impressions of uh, how one likes their face. And then there's rosacea, or kind of reddening of the skin. And so this is, happens to some people. Uh, it's a condition that uh, is not well understood, but it results in kind of facial redness or flushing. It's thought to be related to more visible blood vessels just right under the skin. Uh, it's uh, the the reason of it is unknown, but there are some treatments available, uh, which I will uh, talk briefly about. 
So let's switch gears here. We've talked about some of the age-related changes that we see, some of the blemishes, if you will, that you could use the Facetune app uh, or your various filters on Snapchat or on your computer to get rid of. Or you can kind of come in and see a facial plastic surgeon. We can talk about what options there, there are available. In general, I, the way I think of uh, treatment for facial aging is with the treatment triangle. Uh, it's a nice, easy way to kind of organize it. It's a combination of uh, injectables, laser, and surgery. And you'll kind of notice that uh, injectables kind of really is on top, laser to the left, and surgery to the right. I would say when I began my practice many years ago, um, and even kind of during my training, surgery was really the go-to answer for the majority of uh, uh, problems presenting to our offices. And so I would say uh, over the past two decades, surgery has become uh, an important but less utilized option because of the arrival of really innovative and novel injectable agents uh, to turn back the clock of aging, as well as laser and light treatments that really make a significant impact on uh, a patient's facial appearance as well as function. Um, let's talk about location. So, Location, location, location. Location is really everything to understanding how uh, we treat the different parts of the face in terms of what options people may have. Uh, so one of the um, areas in blue is what's shown is tend to be areas where people as we age lose volume. Uh, what's highlighted in pink are areas that it, it has some volume loss effect, but it's really related to the loss of elasticity or the, the relax, relaxation of the soft tissues or sagging that can happen. Um, and so the area is in pink, so which is really the lower third and the neck are often treated with surgery versus the rest of the face, while there may be some surgical options, uh, we've really kind of navigated uh, or pushed ourselves to really innovative and or, creating techniques that are more non-surgical, that have less downtime, get patients back uh, to their activities and work in a more expeditious fashion. So I'm gonna talk about a couple surgeries just to be complete, uh, because there are situations where uh, the other two arms on the treatment triangle, the injectables and lasers just won't do the trick. You know, So especially as the aging associated changes become more moderate to severe. So we're going to talk about some of the, the brows. And so as we age, we tend to form uh, for horizontal wrinkles along our forehead. And as we age, our eyebrows start to droop uh, with time. Now, some people, because of genes, I've seen patients in their 20s or 30s where they have very droopy eyebrows. Now, But this tends to be an issue as we head into our late 40s, 50s, and thereafter. Um, you know, before surgery would be much more involved with much larger incisions. Now, depending on uh, various patient uh, factors, we're able to downscale the extent of surgery uh, and still get a very good result just through much smaller incisions, about two, three centimeter incisions hidden well in the hairline and a larger incision on the side along the temple. And through this, uh, combined with little telescopes and cameras, we're able to uh, perform a surgery that would require much bigger incisions to do, uh, therefore minimizing the recovery time, as well as some of the potential side effects related to numbness and so on and so forth. Uh, next is uh, blepharoplasty. Uh, I would say about two decades ago, this was the gold standard, the way to go when it came to um, issues around the eye. So also, as we have talked about the upper eyelid, you tend to either form some wrinkling or excess skin. Uh, you start forming some hollows or grooves around your lower eyelid um, and some wrinkling and fine lines uh, around the eyes, especially laterally here on the side or underneath. Um, and our usual go-to a couple of decades ago, this person would definitely get surgery coming in and there wasn't really any other alternative. Um, now I would say uh, that's really shifted and I'm gonna kind of show you some of the techniques that we have uh, well short of surgery. But you can see surgery still has a role in, in the treatment of kind of the aging eye lids and the aging eye area um, uh, that can still 
rejuvenate uh, the upper and lower eyelids. Furthermore, as however, as things get more severe, you get a lot of excess skin, a lot of droopy eyebrow, a lot of excess skin or deep grooves or kind of really poochy fat sticking out of the eye, lower eyelid area. That's really where surgery, uh, you know, there really isn't an alternative option. Next, when it comes to the lower third of the face, the face and neck area, the face and neck lift uh, initially has always been the go-to. I'm going to show you some kind of more innovative options uh, as uh, in the mild to moderate uh, severity categories to treat uh, the areas of the, the lower third of the face. Uh, you can do this. Uh, it's an outpatient procedure. It's about a week-long recovery. You'll have incisions as kind of marked out here that are fairly well hidden around the ear, behind the ear, along the hairline. Um, so well hidden uh, incisions and then underneath the neck um, uh, to get the types of results uh, as shown here uh, from this paper in 2018. And so as we age, we start forming jowls or uh, relaxation of our neck skin. If you have some excess fat in this area, uh, just relaxed muscles. A face and neck lift is a great option for patients to take them from what's on the left side over to what's on the right side here. And you can see improvement uh, in the jawline, uh, improvement in the neck contour and, and, and removal of the excess skin. Um, and then depending on uh, the type of face neck lift, you can get you know a, a kind of a more pulled result, less pulled result. There's some variation that exists, and that's important uh, to understand because different patients and different people are looking or wanting different types of, um, uh, of results, and we can achieve that. Uh, fat grafting, and so this is a surgical approach, but this is kind of uh, um, headed toward almost the non-surgical, if you will. But uh, patients, as we lose volume as we age, um, and, but we do have some excess fat in you know non-ideal areas such as around the thighs or around the belly. Uh, taking fat from this area and transplanting it in the face is definitely a, a nice option, as what you can kind of see here in this patient who's in her 30s, who's developed some smile lines and some volume loss. And so this is kind of before. You can see less volume in the cheek area. And this is after um, a couple sessions. And so the traditional, you do about two to three sessions, uh, three, four months apart, uh, depending on any particular patient's needs uh, to get uh, a one, two year type of result. And so patients who gravitate toward, toward this procedure are those that want to use their own tissue or, uh, and use their own material to help rejuvenate their face. Now there's some other kind of novel adjuncts to this, such as platelet-rich plasma, which has been kind of um, popularized as the vampire facelift, for example, which we can add on to help with uh, achieving a little bit more youthful glow, either independently or in combination with, with this type of procedure. So let's switch gears and let's talk about uh, injectables, um, which is one of the, the treatment uh, triangle options. So neuromodulators, this is one of the most common uh, injectable used uh, throughout the country. Uh, there's uh, multiple, uh, initially it was just called Botox or the botulinum toxin. Uh, so Botox was the initial option. There's more uh, options out there, Dysport and Javo. Uh, what this is, is injection of a protein uh, into the area, and what uh, these neuromodulators do is they uh, paralyze muscles. And so you're not actually treating the wrinkle, you're just paralyzing the muscle so you can get the side effect of the wrinkle reduction. And so this is an example of injecting into the muscles around the eye, so you can see the wrinkling that is there before, versus the smoothing effect that happens afterward. Um, that is associated with the paralysis of those muscles. Similarly, uh, injection into the forehead or the uh, the area between the eyebrows, your 11s, if you will, you can see what's on the left is before and then on the right is after the softening uh, and wrinkle reduction that you get, get uh, with that. Now, 
with the wrinkle reduction is the uh, the lack of movement that you're going to get, which is something that is uh, preferred in some situations and not preferred in others. So now these are areas that are FDA approved. Now, if you start using these neuromodulars in other areas, such as around the mouth, around the neck, you may get some of these wrinkle reductions associated with paralysis um, if used thoughtfully and appropriately in other areas of the face. So this is another example uh, of neuromodulation. So kind of as you, you have deeper forehead lines, you can see the softening and effect that can happen. Deep 11s uh, between the eyebrows, the softening that occurs between the eyebrows. Um, and so with this, uh, with this procedure, it's uh, you come into the office. Um, the injections take uh, about uh, uh, 30 seconds in each site, uh, up to a minute. So you know, one appointment takes about uh, five to 10 minutes to to complete the injections. Um, uh, they're well tolerated. The way the neuromodulators work, it takes a couple days to take effect, and so you don't expect. Uh, the wrinkle reduction to happen right away, especially when if the wrinkles are deeper. Uh, the paralysis takes about two, three days to kick in, after which you will start seeing the smoothing effect over the next subsequent week or two. And so when it comes timing, if you have a big event plan, you don't want to get this right before. You want to kind of think about this, you know, one, two weeks uh, prior to your event uh, just to maximize uh, the, the wrinkle reduction. Now, other areas that you can utilize this that we utilize uh, quite frequently uh, is around the mouth as well as uh, along the, the corners of the jaw. And so around the mouth, some people, and I'm going to use the uh, more approved term, the resting frowny face, uh, if you will, um, come in to see me because they'll say, you know, look, people, especially when I'm on Zoom, they think I'm displeased. I, I'm looking kind of upset or I'm, I'm not happy. Uh, related to what's being uh, talked about when I, I feel perfectly fine. And so in these types of situations, often it's because the way uh, any particular patient's facial muscles are kind of wired, the muscles that pull the corner of the mouth down are a little bit more active than the muscles that are pulling the corner of the mouth up. And so in this situation, if you paralyze uh, the muscles that are pulling the corner of the mouth down, you're going to get a nice softening effect on the corner of the mouth and so and an inability to frown which most people are completely fine by and so uh, you can take this kind of frown and really turn it upside down if you will and make people look happier look you know more more smiley if you will um, now other patients may be bothered by their uh, kind of contour of their jaws and so and that's related to overactivity or enlarged uh, masseter muscles. And so a very minimally invasive way to uh, help this is with a neuromodular injection. And through injection of the masseter muscles on both sides and waiting a few weeks, because it will take some time for the slimming of the muscle to, to really kick in, you see the nice contouring and appearance of the jaw more streamlined appearance of the jaw that can that can uh, occur. So another very common non-invasive uh, tool that is in our toolbox is the use of dermal fillers. Uh, this has become even more common in, in, as, uh, as the pandemic has pushed us into uh, really a virtual existence as we're looking at ourselves on Zoom and and such similar platforms. And so uh, people have noticed that they have thinning of their lips or their smile lines or areas around the eyes are becoming, the grooves are becoming more prominent and they're looking more tired, um, which uh, is not surprising because the level of fatigue being on being on the computer is in and of itself uh, pretty extreme. And so uh, very common procedures that we do here in our medical spa uh, is injection of dermal fillers. I use uh, cannula to minimize uh, any complications and help uh, minimize any bruising. Uh, and so patients that have thinning of the lips, uh, you can give them more volume uh, with a kind of short procedure that takes about 30, 45 minutes uh, to achieve this type of effect. You can go back to work the same day. Uh, and then kind of continue to, to, to live your life. Uh, so there really isn't downtime that you have related to 
uh, you know, any of the surgical options I've talked about. Uh, that being said, if you have a, a, an event coming up, let's say your wedding or, you know, a, a landmark birthday, if you will, uh, this, this is something you want to think about okay, at least a week or two uh, prior, just because there is some swelling associated with this. So you want to let some of the swelling kind of evolve and to kind of get you to that perfect uh, kind of lip lip volume in preparation for your event. Other, now these are more common FDA approved uses of, uh, of dermal fillers is uh, around the smile area. Uh, you can see in this patient, her left side is much deeper than the right side. So you can see the improvement that you can get uh, with, uh, with the injection of, of these fillers. Uh, and once again, this is a, a, a procedure we do in the office. Uh, it takes about 30 minutes uh, and then go back to, you know, you can go back to work uh, thereafter. Now, more novel areas uh, that, uh, that we've been using a filler on uh, to kind of turn back the clock and also as a, an alternative to surgery is that in that lower third uh, of the face is in jowl areas you can see here. And so this is something uh, that you, you I would say about 20 years ago, the only option for this person would be a, uh, a facelift. But however, in the, in the patient that has the mild at most moderate level of relaxation, jawline disturbance or jowling, uh, in injection of a filler can really help smooth that out in addition to the other areas of the face. Uh, the other area that's also become more common because we're looking at ourselves much closely uh, as we're sitting here on Zoom is around the eyes. And so this groove, uh, the nasojugal groove and the hollowing that we uh, tend to see around the eyes and the associated dark circles around the eyes. And so with just application of a half syringe to a syringe, you can kind of see the results that you get have that smoothing effect around the eyes. Uh, also, a fairly new uh, and innovative treatment is uh, Kybella. This is another injectable uh, uh, agent uh, that uh, this material destroys fat cells. Now, it's FDA approved to be used primarily around the chin area. Uh, there is further research going on to, uh, about the idea of using this other areas to, to dissolve fat, but this has been well described uh, and is something that we offer as well uh, in, uh, in patients that come in with uh, kind of a mild to moderate uh, amount of fat, primarily fat in this uh, area underneath the chin. So the double chin patient, they're bothered by the appearance either in the front view or the side view. Uh, and so this is a very common uh, uh, treatment that patients are, or area that people are trying to rejuvenate. Uh, and so in this particular patient, this is before, this is after four treatments. In general, uh, the company will say uh, six treatments to get this type of benefit, but it depends on the patient, depends on the amount of fat uh, that they have and depends on the response. Um, so you, uh, it's rarely after one treatment, although I've had one patient that had a significant improvement just after one treatment, but usually after about two to three treatments uh, of this area underneath the chin, uh, you'll see, uh, you'll start seeing some improvement and you can tailor it. So you don't have to do six treatments if you're getting, if you're happy with the level of improvement at, after treatment two or three, or even as a matter of fact, one, um, you know, that's kind of where you stop and keep the, keep the injectable in your back pocket if there's any recurrence of fat um, uh, that can occur. So how does this work? Um, so coming to the office, uh, you mark out the area, which is uh, the central area um, underneath the chin, where the majority of the fat is really uh, is really present. Um, you numb up the area with topical as well as injection medication, uh, and then with some markings, you do a calculation of how much Kybella, either one vial or two vial, you're going to inject, depending on how much, how large of an area you need to treat. And so this is a patient. Uh, they got just three treatments, so you can see the significant improvement uh, in that uh, area underneath the chin uh, that she was able to achieve just after three treatments. Now, one of the side effects, uh, if used uh, inappropriately, 
and if you start injecting in areas you shouldn't be injecting, is some facial asymmetry in terms of uh, the smile. And that's really only happens in patients that if you start injecting really outside of the white lines in this in the side of the neck, where you have one of the important nerves that controls uh, the lower lip uh, when it comes to smiling. And so there has been some temporary uh, weakness that's happened that's been reported, but the majority of that is in, in patients that you know we really were, that was treated in areas um, in their initial trials outside of the central area. Okay, I'm going to end with the, the last treatment uh, option of the triangle is these laser and light options. And this, I would say, has really been a game changer uh, in my practice over the past 10 years. Um, things that patients coming in that ordinarily, they themselves would be expecting surgery because either, the, either their friends have had it or they've seen other physicians and surgeons who really encourage them to have surgery for XYZ reason. Um, sometimes there's a laser and light option that actually works way better and the results are better and the, um, the results are, can be even more immediate. And so let's talk about some of this. And so more often I'm going to show you a little bit of video of what one of these treatments would be like. So we had the Cyton system, which is a broadband light, um, is the system. It's an intense pulse light. And so what this is, is, uh, applying light on certain wavelengths to the skin. And so this is a skin level treatment that works at the skin and just right below the skin. And depending on um, how you set the computer system, you're, you can treat uh, various areas or various blemishes that patients have. And so this is really a quick, this is kind of like that Facetune app, if you will, kind of quick, easy after a few treatments, anywhere, anywhere from two to six. Uh, you can show some significant improvement. And so let me show you what a treatment looks like. And so you can see the, the bright lights. So it's important to protect the, uh, the eyes when you're doing this. You can see, and I'm going to show you some of the, the treatments responses that you get. This is, works pretty nicely at kind of befores and afters. Um, and so uh, pr the procedure takes, depending on what we're treating, if we're treating a full face, it takes about 15, 20 minutes. Uh, patients, some patients will require some topical uh, numbing uh, prior to the to procedure. Some don't, it just depends on the patient's sensitivity and their skin sensitivity. After the procedure, uh, you're gonna look like uh, you were just out in the sun and you have kind of the feeling of a very mild sunburn. You may be red. Some patients do get more red depending on how their response to, to light is. That tends to last for a day uh, or two at most. Uh, but this is something that you can just come in, you know, on your lunchtime, your lunch break, uh, get the procedure, go straight back to work um, and go from there. You can put cover up back on there afterward. Um, and so... This is the types of rich results you're getting, uh, and it depends on the patients uh, and depends on um, what we're using it for, but in general, it's anywhere from one to six treatments. Uh, this patient got a really good response just uh, after two treatments of uh, broadband light use. You can see a significant improvement in the pigment reduction that, that came into play. Additionally, for patients with rosacea or very fine uh, capillaries, broken capillaries on the skin. This has become a nice uh, tool in our toolbox. Um, uh, this is after two treatments. You can see, see the significant reduction in the rosacea or the redness uh, that's apparent in this, this gentleman's skin. Uh, combined, doing combination treatments with laser and light. We have an NDAG laser as well. So that's uh, using um, both or one, either one uh, independently uh, can really be beneficial to treat some of the spine as well as larger bed, blood vessels that are right underneath the skin. So you can see the significant improvement in blemishes. This is not uh, touched up, uh, you know, with Snapchat or anything. This is, this is a real result, a significant improvement in this. Now, these are long-term improvements. So people will ask, oh, how long does this last? So if you're eliminating, you know, a lot of these capillaries may come back depending on what your exposure are. So if you're still going back out in the sun and 
getting a lot of sun exposure, tanning beds, you may have some of this return or depending on your genetics or your any other related medical issues. But um, short of that, uh, you know, the treatment is fairly long lasting. Now, um, as part of this, there's a treatment protocol called Forever Young, which I encourage patients uh, to think about doing. And so this is application of intense pulse light, so the same as I kind of showed you, uh, frequently over the course of a year, so three or four times a year. Uh, they've done some studies which show that by applying this, it changes some of the genetic makeup in terms of it activates the, some of the younger associated genes to keep the tone and texture uh, of the skin a little bit more youthful. And so you can see here in the person that this is a, him at age 43, and this is him at age 55 uh, after 12 years of continued uh, intense pulse light treatment uh, throughout the area. And so uh, not only can we help to treat uh, the problem when a person presents with the wrinkle or the groove or the skin blemishes, but there's some preventative that we have now uh, in our toolbox. And we're, we're out of the era where we have to wait till things become so severe where we need to just you know, offer surgery. The next laser option uh, is the is laser resurfacing. And this has also been really, I would say, a game changer uh, in our practice because it offers the ability to uh, chain, really treat the skin. And sometimes that's all you really need. You don't need an aggressive surgery. You can just treat the skin and get some of the, the results that a more aggressive surgery uh, would give you. And so this is just demonstrating an example of what's called a micro laser peel, so a laser resurfacing. So we once again protect the eyes, and with our handheld piece, we're we're resurfacing the upper layers of skin. And so what's nice about this is we can adjust this depending on how much time the patient has to heal, how much time they have available, and how aggressive they want to be. And so we just tune the laser. Uh, to that. And so these are some before and exam after examples of the improvement in the skin layer that can happen in terms of the contour, the tone, the texture, and the appearance, the pore sizes, the smoothing effect. And so I do recommend this to patients quite often. Uh, as we get more severe wrinkling, as what's kind of shown here, doing uh, this is after just one treatment, 10, 10 months after one treatment, but you know, multiple treatments of this over time could help keep the skin a little bit tighter, a little bit more toned. Um, and so you're going to kind of turn back the, the clock as well as uh, erase some of the blemishes and the fine lines and wrinkles that you can see here. One common area people come see me about is lip lines and lines around the lips. This is before uh, neuromodulators would be one of the options or just cover up, frankly. Uh, but really with the advent of the laser, this has changed the game when it comes to treating the lips. And so this is four months after just one treatment, albeit an aggressive treatment uh, to the upper and lower lip area, but you can see the significant improvement in terms of the lines uh, in the lips uh, that were present before. And we really are just, just erasing them away as if as if uh, we're doing our Photoshop. Now this compared to some of the micro laser peels, which are much lighter peels, uh, there is more downtime related to this. Downtime meaning uh, in terms of care. And so uh, it's similar to a micro laser peel. It's just applying ointments. But in terms of recovery, this area will take about two weeks to really recover uh, in, uh, versus the micro laser peel uh, takes about depending on the depth, like one to two to three days. So the eyelids, so this has been, once again, a game changer for the eyelid, especially the lower eyelid area, uh, using a, a laser just to resurface that. So really just softening some of these wrinkles. And so this is a patient that traditionally about 20 years ago, the only option would have been a lower eyelid blepharoplasty or, or a surgery. But here, um, this is about, an, about a 45 minute hour procedure. You just come and go home uh, and you apply uh, ointment on until the area heals and you're gonna get a tightening and smoothing effect. And this is a, a final example of a more deep resurfacing. So more, uh, more involved, there is gonna be more downtime, 
but you can see significant improvement in the level of wrinkling kind of around the cheek, around the eyes. And you'll notice she still has these uh, as she's smiling around the eyes. And so these are related to the uh, one of the, the eye muscles. And so this is where neuromodulators such as Botox would still be important in her management for aging face changes. But you can see still how much younger this person looks compared to here, given just, just the treatment of the skin without any surgery. So these are my references. Include Conclusion, aging uh, occurs to all of us. We uh, get to determine what we can do about it. Uh, fortunately, now there are multiple options available to us and a personalized approach is essential in achieving our goals. And this is our contact information um, and I will open the floor to questions. Thank you for your attention.